So we, continue, we are continuing our series entitled Beginnings. We're looking verse by verse through the book of Genesis. And uh, we are in Genesis chapter 1. Uh, you can go to our uh, church uh, Facebook page, and um, like Shannon did this week, and like it, of course. But uh, you can also go, go and look at a couple of sermons uh, from uh, Bible studies from Revelation. Uh, we did that uh, verse by verse through the book of Revelation. That was the last book of the Bible. And now we're, that was a Bible study Wednesday nights, but now we're preaching through the book of Genesis, uh, at least through the first 11 chapters. And then we, at, at the end of chapter 11, it starts uh, looking at uh, Abraham and, and the Jews. And so we'll see uh, about going further. Uh, but this will take us almost a year to go just through the chapter 11. And today uh, we are on our sixth sermon for beginnings. Today we're looking at God said, let there be lights, plural, lights. Uh, we saw that in uh, day one there, let there be light, and he, he separated light from darkness. But today we're looking at uh, Genesis chapter 1, beginning in verse 14. We'll read that in just a second. Naturalistic science has always struggled to explain all the stars and the planets that exist in the universe. How could so much have, quote, evolved out of nothing? How did the stars get scattered across such a vast expanse of space? Why is there such diversity among the stars? What sets the stars ablaze? And where did the planets come from? Well, Genesis chapter 1 gives a simple answer. God made them all. In the beginning, God. Pretty simple answer. He, God, spoke them into existence. Their vastness, their complexity, their beauty, and their sheer number all reveal the glory and the wisdom of an all-powerful creator. How great is our God? We only have to look up in the air and see how great He is. But even greater than that, which we'll see in a couple of weeks, is when we look into the eyes of of a human being. That's how great our God is. Because we are created in His image. My daughter is not feeling well this morning. From uh, what I understand. But she is 30. Uh, did she? Is it 36 weeks? 36 and a half weeks pregnant. So I mean she's about to pop. At any moment. Okay. I mean she goes. Oh. I'm like. Oh. Are we ready? Is it time to go? Because here's what's going to happen. Because of COVID. And some of you have experienced this. Because of COVID. Uh, with somebody having surgery, we're going to go at 2 o'clock in the morning and, you know, we, we're not going to go in the birthing suite or in the lobby. We'll be stuck in the parking lot in the car, but we'll be there. <laughs> because we want to see our little grandson. When we're going to look in that little boy's eyes, we're going to see the beauty of what God created. Amen. Amen. So we'll look at that in a few weeks. But today we're looking at the universe, the stars, the great creator. When we look at the sun and the moon and the Stars, we are reminded of how amazing that such a creator would lavish his grace and his favor upon us, upon me. When King David looked at the vastness of space, he wrote this in Psalms, uh, I mean about a thousand years even before Jesus, over three thousand years ago, he wrote, when I look at the night sky and I see the work of uh, uh, of your fingers, of course, God, uh, the moon and the stars that you have set in place. What are marvels that you should think of us, mere humans, that we should that you should care for us, for me? From day four, now we looked at uh, day one and day two and day three, but from day four on, which is what we look at today, God begins to fill His creation. And he starts with the expanse of the heavens, creating heaven, uh, heavenly luminaries to guide his people. There is nothing more fascinating than the study of the heavenly bodies. Dr. Merrill Neff says in his book, The Glories of the Stars, quote, We rush headlong into the rut of everyday existence, failing to lift up our eyes to the pageantry of the stars. The eternal jewels of the night. It's time that we look up into space and stare 
at the stars and the one who created the stars. We're going to see in a minute that many in our culture worship the stars and the planets and the universe. But the Bible says don't worship the creation, but worship the creator who created the creation. And so when we look up, we shouldn't say, well, uh, well, I'm an Aries, and there's my sign, and, and there's my zodiac sign, there's the, and, you know, and, 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 and Jupiter's moving into position to, 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 to you know, so, so now, I, I, you know, I can go out and, and find a good job. You know, I mean, people, you know, they read their hearts, they look at all this stuff. Instead of doing that, we just need to look into the heavens and say, wow, what a God we serve. Yeah. What a God. Look how beautiful. So now that you're comfortable... Why don't we stand? I don't want to get y'all too comfortable. You don't got to, you might fall asleep on me. Genesis chapter 1, beginning in verse 14. God's word says this. I'm reading on the Holy Christian standard of the Bible. God says, Then God said, Right here we see it again, right? We saw it in, in verse 6, in verse 3. We saw it in verse 6. We saw it in verse 9. We see it again in verse 11. And now we see it again uh, in verse 14. God said, let there be lights, basically the sun and the moon, in the expanse of the sky to separate the day from the night. They will serve as signs for festivals and for days and years. They will be lights in the expanse of the sky to promote light on the earth. And I love this again, I said this last week, and it was so. I mean, again, I said this uh, last week, but, you know, when I said something in my house, it was usually never so. You know, it was debated, it was argued, it was, you know, it, it, even even today, when I, you know, uh, I almost have an empty nest, you know, just, just Jessica. Uh, it's just my wife and I, and I say something, and it ain't very seldom so, all right? But by the way, when she says something, it's so. But anyway, God says, and it was so, it didn't happen. Verse 16, God made the two great lights, the greater light to have dominion over the day and the lesser light to have dominion over the night as well as the stars. And God placed them in the expanse of the sky to provide light on the earth. Again, he says that's the second time he says that, to provide light on the earth. But why is the earth so special? Because he's going to create us, create us to be on the earth. And then he says in verse 18, to dominate the night and the, no the day and the night and to separate light from darkness. And God saw that it was good. And evening came, and then morning, on the fourth day. You may be seated. Before we can see the Redeemer, as we sang, uh, 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 th we just sang the song about the Redeemer, of course, Jesus Christ, we must first observe the Creator and His great creation. If we cannot clearly see the work of the Creator God, in life, in Genesis, how can we see the work of the Messiah who came to save us from our sins? If we can't believe that God is, is how great is God, how powerful is God, how mighty is God, how awesome is God, how perfect is God. If we can't see God like that, then how in the world can we see a, a Jesus as the Redeemer? As believers, we must stand up against the tidal wave of secular, naturalistic Evolution, which states that everything evolved by accident and that there is no God. Evolution has never been observed, documented, or recorded with an actual factual basis. It is a formula used by those seeking to discredit God, and it is a false religious system that has utterly failed our society. Yet it is continually propped up by those who refuse to accept the fact, by faith, that there is a God who created all of this. G.K. Ch Chesterton says this about belief. He says, it is, most often uh, uh, it is most often supposed that when people stop believing in God, that they believe in nothing. That's not the case. When people stop believing in God, he says this, when people stop believing in God, it's worse than that, they stop believing in anything. It's not that they don't believe in nothing, they don't believe in anything. It is in Genesis, however, that we see God the Creator at work. It is in Genesis that we have the essential background for the rest of Scripture. And man, if you get Genesis wrong, you get the whole rest of Scripture wrong. 
It is in Genesis that we determine what we believe about God, what we believe about life, what we believe about mankind, what we believe about purpose of life, what we believe about morality, what we believe about the future, what we believe about destiny. It is in Genesis that the foundations of all truth is found. Ken Han, the founder of, of Answers in Genesis, says that to err in the beginning is to set oneself on a course of error that will take him further and further from the truth. So when you err in the book of Genesis, you go further and further from the truth of God. So why are you preaching through Genesis? I think I just made my point. It's important. It is in Genesis that we will continue to learn about God's creation. So let's look at the light which lights the world. Three things this morning, and they're going to go rather quickly. <laughs> and I was, for those of you who come every week, you know, I, I mean, that's just, I love this Karen. She laughs at all my supposed jokes, all right? My wife used to laugh at them. My kids used to love them. Now they're like, oh, father. First thing we see in verse 14, that light divides. Very simple. God speaks that lights of heavens to exist and they begin to shine. Isn't that amazing? Notice that God does, attempt, does not attempt to prove his existence. He simply says, and, and creation begins to form out of his words. And God said, boom! Creation declares God's existence. You see, the universe is surrounded by design. Everything is... Design. By design. We have seen on day one that God lights the earth with himself. But on day four we see God lighting the earth through the sun and the moon and the stars. The stars, the moon and the sun are not the creators of light, but God is the creator of light. God creates light. He happens to use them as instruments of light that has already been before them and without them. Now notice, I know the Bible says, and we looked at this in, Gen in Genesis uh, for day one, we know that the Bible says that there will be no more sun in the future. Well, well all of is going to be lit. See, God chooses to use the sun uh, and the moon. The moon reflects the sunlight, and, 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 and thus we have light, and it separates light from darkness. But one day there will be no more sun. I mean, it will not be necessary because, well, where are we going to get our light? From God! He is light. We won't need the sun. He just uses the sun. It's a tool. That's how big God is. If you know anything about astro astronomy, you know that the sun's a big deal. Well, God's bigger than the sun. Amen. The sun's just a small instrument of what God uses to light the earth. Right. How big is your God? My, God's, my God's pretty big. When the sun's a little, uh, you know, he just flings it out like a marble. You know, you're throwing a, 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 a ping pong ball like this. <laughs> just flings it out there. And that's how big my God. I'm going to fling that out there and just let it light the earth. Which I'm creating for my people. People created in my image. It's an issue. The heavenly lights were used to divide day from night. Number two, light designates in verse 14. Not only did God create a permanent life source for day and night, but he designed it so that it, the earth orbits the sun. The earth spins and tilts, giving us days and years and seasons. Y'all like fall season? I like fall season. It's kind of cool. Kind of, you know, I, I can't wait till fall season. We, we've only had one little glimpse of it so far. But, you know, I like fall season. I'm still cutting grass, all right? I mean, that's, that's a problem. Nobody should be cutting grass in November. I'm still cutting my grass. I mean, like, oh, when's the fall going to get? In Hawaii, they didn't have a fall. I mean, it was always hot. You know, it's like, I, I like the different seasons. Well, God created it that way. The speed of the earth as it rotates on its axis determines a 24-hour day. Yet the speed is regulated by the moon, which acts as a break upon the earth, raising and lowering tides. I mean, that didn't just happen. That's designed that way. How, how can that just happen? The moon restricts the speed of the rotation of the earth uh, uh, to the exact time that makes possible the 24-hour day, which is the length of time best adapted to the needs of mankind. As the earth makes one complete orbit around the sun is one earth year. 
The ancients knew exactly when the summer and the winter solstice were based on the position of the sun and therefore knew when to plant and knew when to harvest their crops by the position of the sun. It was by design. I mean, we don't do it as much anymore. We, you know, we have a calendar. We, you know, the calendar, what we, we, we have a Roman calendar. Well, there was a lot of history and a lot of civilization before the Roman calendar. People looked at the sun, they navigated through the stars and the oceans, and they, they, they knew when to plant, they knew when to harvest by looking at the sun and the tilt of the earth and, 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 and all the signs and, and tools that God gave us. It's amazing. Now us, we don't even like, we don't even look at the thing, you know, we can draw, we just look at the car in front of us, you know, we're busy, you know, busy doing our own thing, you know, look up every once in a while. Now, don't be driving and look up, you know, that's what I do, and you know, that's why when you buy it, you know, it's like, hey, he's drunk, I'm not drunk, I'm just like this. <laughs> uh -huh, I heard that, uh-huh, the guy who wrote with me to a football game, huh? Yeah. I told David, I said, David, we're going to go to a pastor's conference. He said, you drive it or my drive it. I said, I'm driving. I, I think he declined to come. <laughs> he didn't. You know, you drive it. Right? Uh, stop. You know, David and I was talking about this week. You know, I, we read a book, both as pastors, one time. It's called Simple Church. You know what? It's not simple church. It's simple life, right? Just stop. Look. Listen. When we do that, life becomes a little simple. Just stop. Some of you have had loved ones who are no longer here with you. I, 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 there's that song, uh, Brenda posted it on Facebook, but it's that song is about uh, the only scars in heaven are going to be the scars of the one that holds you, you know, the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's uh, written by uh, Casting Crowns. And um, it's, a, it's a powerful song for a, for a funeral and celebrating the person's life. And, and But, you know, in the song it talks about, you know, stop. I wish this would have been the last time I saw you, it says in the song. I, I would have stayed longer. I would have hugged you longer. I remember, I, I don't have a close family friend, a mother, a father, a husband, a wife, a child that passed away. But so the closest I can get is a grandfather. I remember seeing in, in I don't know, 1992, 1993 or so, the last time I saw my grandfather, he was sitting on the edge of, his, uh, of the couch. He was sitting on the edge of the couch. And I say this because it reminds me, he was an Atlanta Braves fan. And the Atlanta Braves just made it to the World Series. All right, against uh, who they play? Oh, against the Houston Astros, okay? Uh, and so it's the Astros and the Braves are playing in the, in the World Series. And my grandfather's a big Braves fan, but when he was a Braves fan, the Braves wasn't any good, right? And, and he was sitting on the edge of his seat, and he had his coffee in his hand, and I could see him through the door. You know, there's a glass door, storm door, and I could see him through the door. And my wife and I pulled out. I don't even know if my wife knew me, but I pulled out. I was going back to college, and I pulled out. And it was the last time I saw him. Stop. Look. Listen. Simplify your life. Look, look at the stars. Look at the sun. Uh, I remember Brother Richard was saying, man, he loves the sunrise. I said, man, I didn't know the sunrise in the morning because I, I hate the sunrise. I mean, I like the sunset. I'm a night guy, right? You know, I like it later. And, and Brother, Brother Richard told me last week, he loves the sunrise. Let's just, just take it in. Life's too short. Things happen too fast. Life's too precious. God designed things that way. Let me continue. The ancients knew about it because God put the lights in the sky, not only to mark time, but to serve as signs. The sun, the moon, and the stars are constant reminder of God's power, His design, His provisions uh, for His inhabitants, His protection. The deists of old were wrong. God really does care about His creation. And he does involve himself in the affairs of mankind. All we have to do is look at the sky. We know that the, uh, the stars were used for navigation. The most famous navigating story we know is that the, the wise guys, you know, the, 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 the wise guys that traveled from the east, the, the wise men, right? The, the wise guys that traveled from the east, they were looking at a star, and the star led them to Jesus, the child that had been born. In Matthew chapter 2, Jesus said that there will be signs at the end of the age from the stars and the moon and, 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 and the sun. In Luke 21, the Bible says the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows his handiwork. In Psalms 19, 1. 
Well, can you prove the existence of God? Yes, I can. Look up. I mean, just look up. Come to my house at night. We're going to go to, you know, we live in the country. I mean, it's, you know, Brother Mike doesn't think it's the country. Come to my house and burn it. Mike lives here in Burnt in Canada. He came to my house uh, help me move or something. Oh, no, he's bring me some firewood last year. Uh, and he looked at me and he said, man, you live in the city. I'm like, this is burnt. It ain't the city. You know, he, you know, he lives out in the country, but I think I live out in the country too. But you can just go out, come to my house at night. We'll turn out the lights and we'll just look up. And I'll say, now you tell me there's not a God. The celestial bodies are for our benefit, but should not be worshipped by us. Now, I, I, you know, I have people that I know, you may know, they worship the stars. They, they worship the creation, the rocks, and, 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 and the signs. And, 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 and the Bible says the prophets Jeremiah and Isaiah condemn the worship of those bodies and the practice of astrology. Amen. We are to worship the creator and not his creation. The Bible says in Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 19, when you look to the heavens... And see the sun, the moon, and the stars, all the array of the heaven. Do not be led astray to bow down and worship them. The Lord your God has provided them for all people everywhere under heaven. They're not to be worshipped. They're, they're to be uh, uh, admired. And one, wow, look how beautiful that is. And admired because God created it for us. As tools. He designated it for me. When's the last time you looked at a sunset? When's the last time you, you looked at, understood what God was creating in the beauty? Number three, the, the Bible says uh, in verse 15 that the light dispels darkness. It dispels. The light surrounding the earth was given to illuminate the earth and dispel the darkness. Why is the light on earth so important? This planet that God would have his greatest creation? Us. This was the place where God would send His only meek son to die. Think about that. Have you ever thought about that? I wrote that and I thought about it. Wow, I said, you know, I, that's amazing. God prepared, and we know that Jesus was there, the, the Trinity, Jesus was there. So, so they were preparing the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They were preparing the earth, not only for us, but they knew that Jesus would have to come and die on the cross for our sins. He, that Jesus would have to come and redeem us because of our selfishness, because of our choice of rejecting God and His plan for our life, because of our sin. So, so God not only created it for us, but He also created, He knew that, he knew that Jesus was going to have to come on the earth, on this planet, to die for us. This was the place that light was going to overcome darkness. What a image, the light of the world. Jesus Christ was going to overcome darkness. This is the place where God, through His Son, came to redeem us and once again overcome the darkness as we see in Genesis chapter 1. This is the place where we can dispel the darkness once again. I had a sermon series in one of my churches and it was, it was overcoming darkness. I spent about 10 or 12 sermons looking in the Bible about how light overcomes darkness. We can overcome the darkness in our life through Jesus Christ. There's a lot of darkness in our lives. I mean, some of us are, uh, we, we, we've been abused, or, or, or some of us grew up in, in, in dysfunctional families, or, or families of divorce, or, or hatred, or bigotry, or, or, or idolatry, or, or, I mean, anything that you could think of, some of us in this room have experienced through the darkness of the world and the evilness of the world. And let me hear, let me hear, let, let, let me be here this morning and tell you that you can overcome the darkness through the light of the world. His name is Jesus. I, well, you don't know what happened in my life. Well, you don't know what happened in mine. Well, it's as bad as it can be. Well, I got a savior who's better than that. Who's bigger than that? Who can help dispel the darkness that people have done in your life, or the darkness that you've done in your own life? The spiritual darkness. It is in the moral darkness of this age that we as believers are to reflect the light of God in us. It's a very important point. The only Christ this world can see is the Christ that they see in you and me. 
We are reflections, just like the moon. I think I might have that in my next slide. Yeah, just like the moon. The moon is dark. It only reflects what? The light of the sun. We're like the moon. Many of us, though, however, have gotten between the moon. Uh, how, does that, how does the eclipse go? It's the moon is between, the earth is between the moon and the sun, and then the moon goes dark, and, so, and it's an eclipse. So, something out of that. Right? I'm sorry, I'm just I'm play one on TV, and I didn't sleep at a Holiday Inn Express last night, so I don't know what I'm talking about sometimes. I'm getting away from my notes. I'm dangerous when we're talking about, you know, science. But, you know, the earth goes between the moon and the sun, and, and, and there's, a, there's an eclipse. And, it gets, and the moon becomes dark in the middle of the day, and there's no reflection anymore. That's what happens to us as Christians. We don't let the sun reflect us. The, the words of God that, that, in, that, that, that illuminates our, our life and, 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 and illuminates the sin in our lives. And, and don't, let it, don't let it cleanse us out and reflect Christ. When, when people look at us, they should see the light of God living in us, shining through us. You are the light of the world. And if you are the light of the world, we're living in the Bible says the world is dark, and the Bible says that, that we're living in a dark place, and he says, Well, I'm the light of the world, but you know what I'm gonna do with my light? I'm gonna put a bushel over it. You know, I'm, 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 gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna cap it. Well, that's just stupid. If you're the light of the world, let it shine, man. Let it shine. This little light of mine. I'm going to let it shine. Did you, wasn't that part of your medley the other day? This little light of mine? I don't know. Anyway, you sang like a, a, a child song, you know, and then an adult. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. But, you know, I don't know. You, you remember that? Jesus loves me. Y'all didn't hire me for my singing skills, okay? It's simple. And if the devil doesn't like it, he can see it on attack. Ouch! Simple. Jesus loves me. This I know. That the Bible tells me so. What? Little, I got a little one. And then when you put your little, you ever been? Uh, now I know some of you been to some <coughs> rock concerts back in the day before you became a believer. You know, <laughs> my, my mom and dad and my brother in the late seventies went to the day of rock and roll in the dome, right? Because I remember that church teacher. It was like Journey and Fog Hat and Ozzy and ACD. I don't know if it's ACD, but anyway, you know all these bands. They hear the seventies bands, and the, the dome, the super dome, is an enclosed building. And my dad had come home high because you know the marijuana in the enclosed <laughs> super dome, and he was running around in his skivvies. Can't scratch fever. I can remember that like yesterday. Uh, he was. Stone out of his mind. And I was just a kid. I'm like 19 years old. I'm like, but that running in the, on the floor, you know, sliding in his sock. Right, right, me, A lot happened at this concert. Talking about light. Lights. Lights. Oh, that was the whole point of that. Oh, yes. And so you go to this. Y'all used to go to these concerts. I know. Don't you lie. Some of y'all went to those concerts and y'all would flick y'all big. You remember that? Y'all would light y'all little lighters. Right? Oh, I didn't smoke. I didn't have a lighter. Right. You'd go to these concerts and you'd light the light, right? You remember a cigarette light? You'd light those things. Well, I like my candles with that. Yeah, right. Yeah. And you'd light light, and you'd look around, and everybody had a light. Like, oh, my goodness. Now what is it, right? No more flickery pick anymore. You know, it's, it's, the, it's the, you know, it's the. Cell phones. It's the cell phones. Yeah. Get out the cell phones. We're going to light up. Or, you know, it's that when you got a light, let it shine, man. Flip your pick. <laughs> that was a commercial. I don't I mean, I just remember those things, right? But I mean, you've been there, you understand that. This little, so if you, you flick your beak and let your light shine, then the person next to you, the person next to you, you can illuminate the world. That's our job. I better get away from flick my beak before I say something that I'm not supposed to say, you know, a slip up. The Bible says that we must no longer live like the world, which is living in darkness, but we must live in the light. We must not be like the world around, uh, walk around the world in blindness, its darkness, its hostility, its obscurity, its failure to understand, its ignorance. We must walk as those who understand what life 
is about reflecting the truth for the world to see that there may be some light in the darkness in which they live. In Matthew chapter 5, I, I don't have it yet. Matthew, yeah, Matthew chapter 5 verse 16 says, You are the light of the world. Let your light shine or shown before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. See, the light is not for me. The light is for others to illuminate their path. And then once their path is illuminated, they're not going to say, Oh, man, that preacher, man. Thank you, Jamie, for lighting my path. Man, don't thank Jamie. Thank Jesus. It's not like Jimmy Swaggart said to uh, Jerry Lee Lewis when Jerry Lee Lewis handed him a car. He said, he, Jerry, Jimmy Swaggart said, Thank you, Jesus. And Jerry Lee Lewis looked at him and said, Don't thank Jesus, Jimmy. Thank Jerry Lee. No, no, you got it wrong, Jerry Lee. You thank Jesus. Because all gifts come from above. He, God can use Jerry Lee, he can use the Pharaoh, he can use anybody to give you a gift. So the Bible says this, In a lunar eclipse, the moon ceases to shine as the earth comes between and the sun. We said that this is what happens when earthly values in our culture obscure the face of Jesus in our lives. The people of God live like the world. We have the same aims as the world, the same goals as the world, the same purposes as the world, the same standards as the world, the same values as the world. When that happens, our light ceases to reflect the light from the Son of God into the world, which desperately needs light. We must always remember that for, the, for as the church goes, so goes society. Oh, America's headed in their own direction. Oh, America's never going to come back. Oh, America needs this. Listen, America does not need a, a new president. Right. I mean, we'd sure like to have one, but we don't need a new president. We don't, we don't need the Republicans to take over in the 2020 uh, next year. And I don't change everything. We don't need gas prices to come down. We don't need the ships to, to be unloaded in the, in the Gulf. We don't need peace in America. We need Jesus. Amen. We need Jesus. That's what we need. We need the church to rise up, to stand up and be the church and let its light shine and reflect Christ in us. And then... And then maybe we can vote for some people who have integrity and character, who believe in life and, 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 and dignity and morality. Maybe they did. When we get the cart before the horse, politicians ain't going to save us. Jesus is going to save us. The Bible says this. Do not love the world or the things of the world that belong to the world. If anyone loves the world, man, it hurts. The love of the Father is not in him. For everything that belongs to the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of one's life, we're going to see that was what tempted Eve, it tempts us, it tempted Jesus, Jesus did not sin, but it tempts us, this is what tempts us, those three things. It's not from the Father, but it is from the world. And the world with its lust is dying, passing away, but the one who does God's will will remain forever. Even if you die. I assume Henry that passed away, his wife that used to teach our children, you know, she used to come to church here. Now, I'm just going to make an assumption. I don't know that's between him and God, but I would assume they came to church here and, and they knew the Lord Jesus Christ, that Henry knew the Lord Jesus Christ. So he died this morning, but to, to die, the Bible says, if you're a believer, is it, it, gain. To die is to live. During the dark winter of 1864, Peterson, Virginia, the Confederate Army of Robert E. Lee faced the Union divisions of General Ulysses S. Grant. The war was now three and a half years old, and the glorious charge had long since given way to the muck and the mud of trench warfare. Late one evening, one of generals, one of Lee's generals, Major uh, uh, George Pickett, Major General George Pickett, received the word that his wife had given birth to a beautiful baby boy. Up and down the line, the Southerners began building huge bonfires in celebration of the event. These fires did not go unnoticed in the northern camps, and soon a nervous Ulysses S. Grant, General Grant, sent out a reconnaissance patrol to see what in the world was going on in the South. The scouts returned, saying that Pickett had a son. Well, it was so happened that Grant and Pickett 
had been contemporaries at West Point, and they knew each other very well. So to honor the occasion, Grant, the, 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 the general on the, the north side, uh, ordered the bonfires to be built in honor of the son of the general on the southern side. And so for miles on both sides of the lines, fires burned. There was no shots fired that night, no yelling back and forth, no war fought, only light, celebrating the birth of a child. But that didn't last long. Soon the fires burned down, and the one, and once again the darkness took over. And the darkness of the night and the darkness of war came again. The good news of Christianity is that in the midst of a great darkness there came a light, and that the darkness was never, ever able to overcome the light again. It was not just a temporary flicker that would burn out, but it was an eternal flame, and that light had a name, and his name was Jesus. Jesus. Finally, the Bible says in verse 16 through 19 that light dominates. Light dominates. When we see the sun, the greater of the two lights, it dominates the day. The light it gives is essential to life on earth. It is called the greater light because it many times it is uh, 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 it is many times larger than the moon, and because it is a light is thousands of times brighter than that of the moon. The sun actually gives off light, while the moon only reflects the light of the sun, which we just saw. But that does not mean that the moon should not be considered the great light, because it serves a great purpose as far as the earth is concerned. The moon governs the night. Following the sunset, the moon is set first on the horizon, and would appear a great light when compared with the little twinkling stars. And when the sun rose in the morning and gradually attained its blaze of glory, it would appear that the greater light that rules and dominates the day, the sun. Notice in only a few words, the Bible tells us that God created all of the stars as well. Oh, and by the way, He set the stars in motion. He just flung them out there. It is now estimated that there are 50 billion stars in the Milky Way galaxy, which is the galaxy we live in, alone. And that every star in our galaxy, there is another galaxy. What? If there's 60 billion, 50 billion stars in the Milky Way galaxy, and for every star there's a galaxy, uh, I mean, that's, that's more than our, our national debt there. I mean, that's, that's a lot. <laughs> I mean, that's a lot. That's more than the 3.5 trillion they want to spend with our tax dollars for nothing. But anyway, that's a lot. I don't want to wrap your head around it. I don't know. I don't, I, you can't. Maybe there's a better way to, to do it. <laughs> we were talking fractions yesterday. My, my daughter's having to take classes, biology and, <clears throat> and things. And, and math comes involved. Now, if you don't know, <clears throat> I'm a dummy in many ways, especially when it comes to math. I went to Bible college, uh, did a uh, four-year degree in six years, okay? Five and a half years. That, Brenda, you'll figure that out in a minute. Uh, Four-year degree took me five and a half years. It's not too, not too smart, right? But anyway, uh, then I had to take the graduate exam to get into seminary. Now, graduate exam. Now, I was terrible in math in the beginning, and I haven't had math for six years or five years. And so now I'm having to take math to get into the graduate school. And I had made honors in, in, in Bible college because I didn't have any math in Bible college. And I took the GRE, the graduate uh, equivalence exam, whatever. And... Um, yeah, my wife did way better than me. I did a 2% in the math section. Now you say, what does that mean? Well, that means that the way it works this way, 98% of the people that took the test did better than me in the math section. Am I good at math? By the way, I don't want to meet the 2% that did less than me. <laughs> so my wife and I were talking about fractions yesterday, and we were talking about half, one-third, or one half or one fourth. And you know, and, and when you start to think about it, you're like, one half is greater than, well, I'm gonna get it wrong, one third or one third. And you start to the, the numbers, oh, 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 oh. and I, you know, and I'm like, no, 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 just 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 tell it a different way. Use use illustrations, right? You you, you, you know, use and I just forgot what I was gonna say. Well, how did what did I say? What did I use? You remember knowing forgot the book on the wasn't listening to me, okay. I, I would use uh, uh, illustrations. Yeah. Oh, I got it. So somehow I used the illustrations and it was very good because apparently I can't remember it. 
I'm halfway to 100, remember, because I'm 50. But anyway, um, I want to, so when I think about the billions and billions and billions and trillions and trillions of stars, I wanted you to think of it this way. I have to do a word picture. I mean, numbers just really freak me out, right? So I have to do a word picture. I want you to imagine, let's say, uh, look at every fiber in the carpet. That's a lot of fibers. You know, that might be the Milky Way galaxy, right? Or, or, or look at every kernel, not kernel, but every speck of sand on the seashore. And maybe that's a little bit better way to think of that's how many stars are in the heavens. You understand? What I mean? You get that word picture, you're like, oh, no, I get it, right? So for you dummies, when it comes to numbers, i got to do the word picture. Now you get it. That's a lot of stars, okay? All right, y'all with me? That was a terrible illustration. But anyway. All right, so here, let's finish this sermon. Here we go. The Bible says that these stars and the sun, it was going to dominate one planet. You know, it's amazing they go to Mars and they're like, oh, we, we're going to. We, the world is looking for a place where life exists outside of Earth. I'm not saying there isn't, but you know, like, oh, we found water on, on Mars or frozen stuff on Mars. That means there's water and life can exist. This, this Earth is perfectly created for you and for me. Amen. It's for us. Christ. We should take care of it. I'm not a tree hugging, you know, uh, person. I mean, we, you know, guess what? You cut a tree down, plant a tree, right? No big deal. It, it, you know, it can grow by another tree. I mean, I, 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 Brenda and I, we waste a lot of trees at the church. You know, we print a lot of stuff on our printer. But you know, I mean, it, 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 it's it, it's for us. Oh, let me. The Bible says in Jeremiah. I think this is the the verse. I don't know what happened to that slide. Yet. It says, this is what the Bible says in Jeremiah. It says, this is what the Lord says. He who appoints the sun to shine by day, who decrees the moon and stars to shine by night, who stirs up the sea so that its waves roar, the Lord Almighty, and then there's another thing behind that, and I can't see it because the thing went down. It, it is the Lord, Jeremiah 31, verse 35. It's God who created the heavens. And the earth and flung the stars into space and breathed in a handful of dirt to become a man in Adam, which we'll see later. It's God who sits on the circle of the earth and measures the mountains in a scale and holds the sea in the palm of his hand. It's, it's God who sent his only begotten son to, to the cross of Calvary to, uh, 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 to heal. Uh, and, and, and it's God who is worthy of thousands of ovations of praise. It doesn't matter who walked in here, if it was the President of the United States, Joe Biden, if it was, if it was uh, uh, Trump, if it was uh, Obama, we would stand and, you know, and my, some of us might be like this, you know, or not. we would stand in honor of the office, but it is God who deserves the ovation of praise for us all of the time. You see, space and planets and stars all have their place in God's kingdom. The God is more interested in people than in planets. And he's more interested in souls than in stars. And that's why he sent his son to die on the cross for you and for me. To pay the penalty of your sin and the sin of the entire world. Those who respond to the free gift of salvation found in Jesus Christ. That's how much God loves us. He created us in his image. And then he said, I'm going to give you everything, but we're going to have one limit. One limitation. I'm going to create you as free moral agents to choose if you want to love me or not. I'm going to create this beautiful planet. The stars and the rivers and the mountains and the moon and the seas and the animals, which we'll see next week. And I'm going to create all of this stuff, this perfect environment for you. But I'm going to give you a choice to choose to love me or not. And unfortunately, our descendants, Adam and Eve, chose to not love God. Chose to say, I want something better than you. I, want, I, I can do it on my own. And subsequently, all of us choose to make it without God. We sin. We're accountable for our sin. But the Bible says that is because of the blood of Jesus that our sins could be forgiven. That you and I could have eternal life. 
because of what Christ did for us. We have to give ourselves to Christ. Make Him a Lord of our life. That's all it takes. And then we can begin to appreciate once again the beauty. Not worship the stars, not worship the creation, but the beauty in which God gave us. Amen?